Hey internet friends, isn't it odd that a solitary moment can change everything? How one person's actions can transform the future and influence lives for decades and even centuries? A single wicked act, a handful of rushed lies, retribution, and what we're left with is the thing that emerged from the black pit of chaos. A patient group who has long waited for everyone to forget the past so that they can rewrite it, thereby carving out a new future. We've arrived at their moment, now, as I speak. The culmination of their suffering, their plotting, their efforts. The Anti-Defamation League has waited a long time for their reign, enticing the masses under the guise of all that is just and fair. With their thorns wrapping around society, shaping public discourse, silencing those who would seek to question them, all to be a ruling force, unquestioned and unmatched. Some would even argue that the ADL is the single most influential organization in the United States. But is the ADL worthy of such power, such influence? Are they a betterment to society as they claim? Or are they unfit, illegitimate, their very existence built upon the sleight of hand and half-truths? You'll be able to answer that question for me after this video using official court documents, newspaper articles, witness testimonies, and statements from the victim's living family. I'm going to tell you the story of how the life of little Mary Fagan came to an end, how the Anti-Defamation League rose to power, and why the ADL seeks to erase this moment from the pages of history. As a reminder, facts are not hateful. And as the quote goes, truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. You just let it loose, and it'll defend itself. Let's travel back in time to over a century ago, to my hometown of Atlanta, Georgia, April 26, 1913. Post-Civil War, Atlanta had finally stopped smoldering. Businessmen and workers alike flocked south for opportunity. One of these businessmen was a 29-year-old Jewish man by the name of Leo Frank, who was raised in New York and had spent the last several years touring Europe after graduating from Cornell, learning the ways of business so he could run Atlanta's National Pencil Company, a sweatshop factory where over 100 children were employed. A four-story building caked in grime with little in the way of ventilation where Frank served as a superintendent. Outside of work, Frank was heavily involved in the local Jewish community, becoming president of the Atlanta chapter of B'nai B'rith, which is kind of like a Masonic society with their lodges and doings, but only for Jewish members. B'nai B'rith is the ADL's parent organization and was founded in 1843 in New York as a Jewish counterpart of fraternal orders that were then flourishing in America. It was a Saturday, a holiday to be precise, on the day that was once celebrated as Confederate Memorial Day, when 13-year-old pencil factory worker Mary Fagan entered the office of her boss, Leo Frank, to collect her pay of $1.20. Mary was just 12 years old when she began working for Frank. She and her family, they didn't have much. When her mother was six months pregnant with her, Mary's father died of measles, leaving her mother widowed with four other young children. Mary's mom moved her family from Alabama to East Point, Atlanta, Georgia, where they had more family and more opportunity for employment. Mary herself was a beautiful girl with fair skin, blue eyes, dimples, and long reddish brown hair. And she was described by her family and peers as a sweet girl with a bubbly and loving personality. On this tragic Saturday in 1913, Mary set out to collect her paycheck and meet her boy sweetheart outside of the factory that afternoon so they could go watch the parade together. Sadly, that never happened. Leo Frank would be the last known person to see Mary Fagan alive. The following morning, before the sun had even risen in the east, the night watchman, also known as the security guard of the pencil factory, a black man by the name of Newt Lee, discovered Mary's dead and brutally beaten body discarded in the basement of the factory, amongst a sea of bloody pencil shavings with a cord around her neck. And beside her body, two notes describing her murderer through Mary's point of view. She wrote about a long, tall black man called the Night Witch. It was written like she scribbled it down in her final moments, even though the note wasn't in her handwriting. 
Her autopsy later revealed that the 13-year-old had not only been beaten, but raped by her killer. Of course, Newt Lee was immediately brought in for questioning. He was the main suspect. He'd discovered Mary's body, after all. Police fired a gun right next to Lee's head, and he was subject to intense interrogation as the hunt for Mary's killer commenced. But despite the pressure... Lee never confessed. According to police reports, a blood-soaked shirt was left at Newt Lee's home. Leo Frank's attorney hinted to police where they would find the evidence. Newspapers published this development, and the mob nearly lynched Newt Lee then and there. But police were not as easily swayed. There was strong evidence to support that Leo Frank himself had hired private detectives to frame his night watchman because the detectives had done such a sloppy job. All of this was relayed in the Atlanta Constitution and even in the New York Times in 1914, alongside reports of bribery and witness intimidation. Once Lee was found innocent, two suspects remained. The first suspect was a black man by the name of Jim Conley, the factory's janitor, who curiously held the lowest status job at the factory, yet somehow was paid 50% more than all the other child laborers like Mary. Conley was even given special privileges by his superintendent, Leo Frank. They had an interestingly close working relationship. You see, Conley never had to keep up with his time card. He never had to punch the clock like the others. He could just come and go as he pleased. The second suspect was Conley's boss, Leo Frank, who went on record as the last person to witness Mary alive. Unlike Conley, Leo Frank hired the best defense team money could buy. Unlike Conley, Frank had the money for a legal team to prove his innocence. Not only that, but unlike Conley, Frank had the backing of Benet Brith to influence and sway his trial. The grand jury consisted of 23 members, including five prominent members of the Jewish community in Atlanta, two of which were reportedly from the synagogue Frank attended. Mary Fagan's murder trial made headline after headline all summer. You see, Georgia's summers are notoriously hot and humid. The days are long, the sun unrelenting. All you have to do is walk outside and you'll start sweating. The trial began to heat up after Conley admitted that he wasn't illiterate like he had previously stated. Oh no, he could read and write just fine. So fine, in fact, that Conley swore his boss, Leo Frank, paid him to write Mary's murder note. The one about the long, tall black man, the Night Witch. As Conley continued, it seemed like his involvement was more and more like he was Frank's accomplice, with Frank as the main suspect. Unlike Conley, Frank absolutely refused to be cross-examined. But there was overwhelming evidence against him, including blood and hair left at the crime scene, as well as Frank's ever-changing alibi. Frank's accounts of his interaction with Mary in her final moments began to unravel. They morphed with every retelling. Originally, Frank swore that he stayed in his office following Mary's departure after receiving her pay envelope. But later, Frank stated he might have taken an unconscious bathroom break that would have placed him walking past the metal room, a site where Mary was believed to have been murdered and at the suspected time when the attack occurred. Another young worker was called to the witness stand claiming that she had gone to Frank's office right after Mary had left and Frank wasn't there. He was nowhere to be found and she even waited around for a bit but concluded that Frank had gone home for the day. The character witnesses included a string of female employees who all had the same thing to say about Frank. He was handsy with the girls, he touched them, he stared, he made rude comments. The guy was a well-known pervert and all the female employees knew it. They all said so. Quote, 16-year-old Nellie Wood told the court how Frank had pushed himself against her and touched her breast. 14-year-old Nellie Pettis, a witness for the defense, recounted how Leo Frank had propositioned her for sex. 20 girls in all gave similar testimony about Frank's improprieties. Several male employees described how they had witnessed Leo Frank rub up against young female co-workers a little bit too much. The testimony was so explicit that the judge had to clear the courtroom of women. End quote. After a long, drawn-out trial that garnered immense public attention and claims from the prosecution that alleged bribery and witness tampering from Frank's legal team had occurred, the grand jury reached a unanimous verdict. All the grand jurors, including the five Jewish jurors, 
signed the bill of indictment against Leo Frank. They'd all decided he was guilty. After being convicted of murder, the judge sentenced Frank to death by hanging, which was set to be carried out in October. But after Frank's legal team attempted several failed appeals all the way up to the federal level, 13 separate appeals to be exact, in 1915, under intense political pressure, attorney in Georgia Governor Slayton, on his last day in office, had Frank's sentence reduced to life in prison. Alongside the order, Governor Slayton wrote that the U.S. Supreme Court, quote, found in the trial no error in law and had correctly, in my judgment, found that there was sufficient evidence to sustain the verdict, end quote. Keep in mind that Frank, on top of murdering Mary Fagan, had tried to pin the murder on two different black men. Frank claimed that rape and murder were black crimes, and any black person who testified against him should be barred because their testimony was invalid based on their skin color. When the public heard that Governor Slayton had reduced Frank's sentence, they were angry. They believed the justice system had failed Mary Fagan, the real victim. After all, Governor Slayton was a former partner at the law firm of Frank's defense team. So the public suspected some under the table deals and bribery. As a result, a group of about 25 men who called themselves the Knights of Mary Fagan took justice into their own hands. They kidnapped Leo Frank from prison and hanged him in Marietta, Georgia, his body facing the direction of the Fagan residence. You remember I told you in the beginning that Leo Frank was the president of the Atlanta chapter of B'nai B'rith, an organization whose mission preaches philanthropy and community outreach. But apparently they did a little bit too much community outreach because they were accused of espionage during the Civil War and implicated in the assassination of President Lincoln with the goal of subverting and fragmenting America so that it could once again fall under the British crown. And this was documented by both Gentile and Jewish scholars alike. They were accused of being spies spies for the crown. It didn't matter to B'nai B'rith that Leo Frank was found guilty and convicted of murder by a unanimous jury. Even when he was sitting in his jail cell, the Atlanta chapter re-elected Frank as president. Members of B'nai B'rith stated that they believed the real murderer was Jim Conley, the janitor. And the testimony of a black man, a second-class citizen in their eyes, was unreliable. Furthermore, B'nai B'rith claimed that the trial was too hasty and the only honest people in the courtroom were Frank and his defense team. Everybody else, they claim, was either bribed, threatened, or fell under one all-encompassing term, an anti-Semite. All my sources are listed as the pinned comment under this YouTube video, and as always, I look forward to your comments. Thank you for watching, subscribing, and supporting my channel on Patreon. Bye.